Hey everybody, it's Herbert here. Happy New Year. I am recording this uh, Sunday, January 1st. It's the first day of 2023. And I was kind of inspired to um, uh, make a comprehensive video on kind of my journey, my path uh, that I have gone down in order to lose a whole bunch of weight and keep it off. Um, throughout the past year, I've already found myself um, constantly going off on tangents. Um, you know, sometimes people ask me a question about, you know, how did I drop so much weight or how have I been keeping it off or, you know, you know, how exactly is, are my, is my diet uh, designed or is it working? And so I kind of just got to the point, like maybe I should put something together where I can start putting out resources because, um, you know, sometimes when something's new and it seems to be working, uh, we can be a little skeptical about getting our hopes up because we wonder, you know, like, is it going to keep working? Is it, am I going to, is it going to, um, stop working and go the other way? So, um, you know, I'm about two years into what I've basically assembled into basically my system of beliefs, um, what my discernment process has led me to believe in researching these topics about wellness and fitness and nutrition and weight loss. And so at this point, I feel like um, maybe if I share what has worked for me and what has continued to work for me, that that it might help some other people out there. Um, and so that's why I'm starting this YouTube channel. That's why I'm sharing uh, kind of this comprehensive roadmap that I've put together and why I'm going to continue to share my observations and my habits and, you know, things, uh, things that I do in my own life to make uh, my lifestyle easier. And uh, maybe if this uh, is helping me, it might help some of you. So um, I call this the no BS roadmap to losing a hundred pounds and keeping it off. And I'm sharing that based on my experience because that's approximately how much I am down from my heaviest point. Um, we're going to get into kind of my history and my struggles uh, with uh, dealing with obesity ever since I was a kid. And, um, you know, I'm going to share kind of what has led me down to my current set of beliefs about what I think works for me and what in all likelihood will probably work or at least help somewhat for a lot of other people. Um, so, um, you know, growing up overweight, uh, I think I'm 13 years old there. I really started to get heavy around the third grade. And, uh, you know, I was raised on the standard American diet. Um, it's kind of scares me to think of what my diet was like growing up as a kid. I mean, I had, uh, you know, I had my fair share of fast food. Um, I had my uh, fair share of, uh, um, you know, pizzas and pastas and pancakes and freight fake cheese whiz, um, and Velveeta nachos and cheese. And, you know, I mean, I was raised on a lot of carbs, a lot of fats, a lot of oils, a fair amount of protein, but a considerably lower ratio compared to those other um, calories that I was getting. And it was no wonder um, that I looked the way I did. Um, during this time period, I also had a, a really bad asthma. Um, I was not physically active. Um, I was uh, discouraged early on from physical activity because they'd worried about me having an asthma attack. And then later on, I was just, you know, I had, I was at such a disadvantage. I had no interest in it. So, uh, you know, I was the chubby kid. I was the last kid uh, picked in the uh, gym, you know, dodgeball or whatever we were playing. Um, you know, the, the nickname for me, I had this big round face. They called me um, Pugsley Adams from the Adams family. Right. And, um, you know, and I was always pretty thick skinned about it. You know, I didn't consider myself overly sensitive, but uh, it was a struggle. And uh, to this day, I do have self-image issues. And, you know, sometimes I have to remind myself that, you know, I actually have made it this far. I actually have 
made a lot of improvements. Um, but anyway, that was my history. And, you know, I've been up and down. I've probably tried every single diet um, from like starting at junior high and, and onward. And some things worked a little bit. Some things worked temporarily. And it really took a long time to figure out why what did work was working and, and so that I would I had more control and more I could be more deliberate about what I was doing uh, uh, in terms of creating outcomes. So and this is me at my heaviest. Um, I think I'm about a year into being a dad. Um, I have a lot of stresses going on at that time. Um, you know, financially, I wasn't doing that great. Definitely wasn't getting enough sleep. My diet was bad shape. I had a lot of stress. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a me kind of reverting back to that nutritional baseline I grew up with. You know, I was eating the Chinese food and the fast food and the Italian food. And, you know, so it's anybody who knew me then it wouldn't be a surprise, regardless of what their theories are on weight loss. Um, you know, I'm do I was doing it all wrong by anybody's standards, right? So it's not a surprise that I got that heavy. Um, but what did get harder and harder and harder as I got older is that thing it would get harder to lose the weight. Um, you know, when I was in my early 20s, all I would have to do is pull back on the carbs. And the weight would come off pretty quick and that would uh, become less and less effective as time went on. And even worse was that the there was a more exaggerated yo-yo effect so that the moment I stopped dieting, I would blow up like a balloon. So it was definitely getting harder and harder to keep the weight off. It's definitely getting harder to lose weight. And it was um, every time I regained the weight, it was worse and worse. So, um, and then this was, uh, a brief period where I did lose a lot of weight, um, probably about a, I would say maybe two years after that picture. And I did stuff right, but I didn't know why I did it right. I went on a, a pescatarian diet. And uh, what happened was uh, I did lose a lot of weight. Um, I wasn't happy though, because I I was, I was very hungry and, uh, that was because my fats were so low. And so, yeah, you'll lose weight on a low fat diet. Um, no question about it, but problem is that it wasn't sustainable for me because, um, you know, eventually you get tired of, you know, it's draining and it's stressful when you have a consistent level of hunger that is distracting to you. And, um, you know, and then the moment anything stressful comes up, you know, that's the first temptation to relapse to go back to your old habits. So I knew what worked the hard way, but this time around, um, which started about two years ago, I found a more a more sustainable, more practical, more user-friendly way to lose weight and then also keep it off with more of a sustainable lifestyle. And so here I am today and, um, I'm about the same weight that I was in that last picture, but uh, I have, I would say I'm a bit stronger and um, I'm definitely more satisfied on a day-to-day -day basis. My appetite's more in control on a day-to-day -day basis. I feel better on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, um, you know, I, I've dropped about, I would say not quite a hundred pounds. I'd say about 95 pounds down from my absolute heaviest. And, um, I would say I'd still like to lose another 15 or 20, but I'm not in a rush to get there. I know that that is going to be the result of consistency. Um, but anyway, the second, the difference between the first time and the second time losing weight was that now I understood more of the underlying science about what actually was occurring. And you, it was less shooting in the dark. It was more, oh, okay. Uh, this is what's most likely going on with me metabolically. And so these are the buttons I will need to press in order to start turning those things around. And uh, hopefully uh, as you follow my thought process, maybe you can find something that's useful or insightful um, as I share my approach and my beliefs. And 
what I just want to reinforce is, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. Um, I have references that I will continue to share um, on this YouTube channel that I'm going to be unrolling um, that do come from doctors and do come from research and do come from uh, people with bio, you know, biology backgrounds and things like that. Um, but I'm more sharing, you know, where my discernment process took me and why, you know, why I believe what I believe. And then if you want to dig deeper into it and you want to listen to people who can explain things and get way more into the details than I ever could, you know, I'm hoping that I'm just more of a, a conduit for that. So, um, uh, I hope you find this useful. All right. So what I kind of want to start off with is the, like a high level analogy. And the reason why is because one of the most frustrating things I heard as a kid, you'd hear a lot of these pseudoscientific explanations as to why you're overweight as a kid. You're, you know, you Oh, you just need to eat less. You just need to work out more. Uh, you just need to have more discipline. You just need to have more willpower. And I'm not going to say those things weren't true. But the thing is that, you know, um, it's one thing to, you know, make those general statements. It's another thing to get to the level of implementation, you know, and, and also to realize that things are more complex than that. So, you know, what I think when I think of a metabolism, I think of like a, a fire pit, right? And so when you're asking about well, well, how do I get the fire churned up, right? You know, anybody and everybody knows that you need wood, right? You got to put wood in the fireplace, right? And the less wood you have, the smaller the fire, the 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 less time before the fire goes out. And the more wood, the longer the fire goes on, right? So we all get this, okay? But a lot of times when you were getting nutritional advice, we're being taught that all wood is equal, right? And it's not equal because if I had two fire pits side by side and I put one, I filled one fire pit, let's say with 10 pounds of dry truly decayed, dried out, um, you know, kindling wood. And then in the next fire pit, I put in freshly, uh, freshly cut logs that were still wet, were still green, um, still would take much more effort into burning. Okay. There, you have 10 pounds of wood in both fire pits, but you're not going to get the same results. You're not, it's not just like, oh, it's just about having, you know, plus or minus X amount of wood. It's in one fire pit, the wood is delivered in a format, in a form where it's going to, it's going to enhance the burn of the fire. It's going to uh, get the fire going quicker and it's going to promote the ability to burn more and more wood as you feed that fire. And then the other wood, even though it's also wood, is in a form where it's more likely to smother out. It's going to be more resistant to getting the fire started. It's going to be it's going to compromise the ability of that fire to build and sustain, right? So so that's a lot of times when I see conventional weight loss advice, conventional fitness advice, you know, they just say, oh, it's all about the how much wood you have. It's like, that's part of it. That's part of the equation. But it's also the form in which you feed the wood to the fire pit that is going to determine the reaction, the chemical reaction, the outcome, how much of a fire you can build, right? So there's a huge difference. And I feel like there's just a lot of these pathological oversimplifications that are hurled around where, where it's not that it's not what they're saying is irrelevant, but it's not the only part of it. It's one variable, right? And so this is going to bring us into our first um, topic, which is about busting myths. And, and so to me, you know, 
if there's one thing that is like when when people say this, I'm like, oh, thanks a lot, Captain Obvious. Like, no duh, it's calories in, calories out. Like nobody's disagreeing that calories matter, right? If you have it doesn't matter what you're eating, if if you go from eating 2,000 calories to 5,000 calories, you're probably going to gain weight. And if you go from eating 5,000 calories to 2,000 calories, you're probably going to lose weight, right? So yes, calories matter, but that doesn't mean all calories are created equal. That doesn't mean that all nutrient profiles are going to have the same uh, metabolic effects that raises or lowers your baseline, your your resting metabolism for for how many calories you're burning throughout a day so it's this it goes back to that fire pit analogy it's like okay if one guy eats you know a proper nutritional split of macros and they're and they have all their micronutrients and right and they're eating three thousand calories of that that person may be able to eat three thousand calories and lose weight while a person who's eating two thousand calories of nachos and cheese is going to be gaining weight because it's not just about calories they also have different metabolic effects so weight loss is about metabolic health because to the extent that you can optimize the health of your body your metabolism the underlying cellular and hormonal processes is the extent that you can eat more while still maintaining or or achieving a healthy uh, a body weight and a healthy fat composition okay so this is like you know calories in calories out is like is such a oversimplification of in, in my opinion of how we need to think about achieving better what we're really talking about is better body compositions lower percentages of body fat into a uh, until you get into a healthy range and then also having lean body mass which also supports our health and and our metabolism okay uh, myth number two is, uh, is satiety is all about willpower. That was another oversimplification that I heard, I've heard. i heard throughout the years. You know, you just got to dig deeper. It's, it's just about the discipline. It's just about, um, you know, it's just about like making that choice. And um, it's really not the case. What, what, what really is the case is that if I eat certain things, that's going to hijack my ability to control myself. And if I eat other things, that's going to naturally bring about a sense of satiety so that the temptation is not there for eat me to, eat, to overeat or eat the wrong things. So um, satiety is about proper nutrition. If I'm eating the right foods, I'm going to get full quicker. I'm going to stay full longer and I'm going to have less of that those compulsions to say oh i need i need something crunchy i need something sweet i need that very often in my opinion is the result of you eating some sort of problematic food or not getting some sort of adequate nutrient and and to me that's where the satiety satiety is is about your ability to feel satisfied and if you're not feeling satisfied rather than just punishing yourself why not ask ourselves like, well, what if we tweak things so that I can get satisfied off of less food or less calories, right? So that's another myth in my opinion. Uh, myth number three is, um, you know, like people just, people say, well, you know, people just used to be more active back in the day. It's like, in some respects, yes, but gyms weren't, a thing a hundred years ago. Um, you know, maybe there was some jogging, but the thing is, even the most inactive people a hundred years ago were thinner, right? Yeah, I was actually looking at a a, a photograph of um, they have like these uh, photos of like the 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 steel the I guess the construction workers that are on the top of these skyscrapers under construction. Right. They're 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 sitting on these iron beams, you know, in their hard hats. OK. And I I looked at a picture from I, I guess it was around the 1950s. And then I looked at a picture today. Now, all of those guys were working really hard. All of them. 
right? Today's blue collar worker, maybe they have some better gadgets and gizmos, but if you're up there climbing, getting up and down, lifting materials, you know, on your knees all day, okay, you're burning a lot of calories either way. Today's construction worker works hard than the 1920s banker. Okay, so so that doesn't really make sense. And when you compared the two photos from 1950 to today, the guys in the 1950s were all thin. They were all thin. They were all fit. And these guys probably drank more booze and smoked more cigarettes and chewed more tobacco and had less health care um, modalities made available to them than the people in the more me recent photograph, right? So I don't buy that. And the other reason I don't buy it is because if you've ever been to a gym and you've ever, ever talked to a personal trainer, first thing they tell you is you can't out train a bad diet. You know, you could go and lift weights for an hour and then do another hour cardio. And then if you go home and eat, a, you know, a sleeve of Oreos and Cinnabons, you're still going to get fat. So so I'm not buying that that myth that, oh, people just used to be more active. You know, a 1920s banker who didn't go to the gym, who wasn't physically active, who had the money to pay other people to do a lot of the physical stuff for them, on average is still thinner than your day laboring or blue collar worker who is burning a substantial amount of calories throughout the day, while also, you know, probably drinking more and, and eating more. People used to also eat more calories back in the day, um, which I'm not going to get into, but there's references about people generally eating higher calorie more higher higher calorie dense foods back in the day so um to me this is not this is not accurate in my opinion okay myth number 4 no pain no gain i believe this is true to an extent so it's not that these are false but they're partially true or they're they're true up to a certain point and, and what i mean by that is like okay um you're burning calories and increasing your level of fitness and increasing your level of conditioning and growing muscle mass yes those are all in general good useful things that will aid in your ability to lose weight maintain weight have a healthy metabolism okay but you can get into the point of diminishing returns where you're stressing your body and it's actually having more of a negative effect, right? Your cortisol levels are going up. Uh, you're doing more damage to your body than you can recover from, uh, particularly if you're not getting enough sleep, right? And so uh, what, before I keyed in on what my body needed diet-wise, I actually worked out harder than I do today, and it was still much heavier. I was lifting three to four times a week, and doing 30 to 50 minutes of cardio after that on those gym sessions and I and probably eating less calories than I am today and I was much much fatter much much heavier and I I was strong but you can be just cuz you have a lot of muscle mass doesn't mean that that's going to make you leaner so so the bottom line is that um what really works is self care right whereas what is the optimal amount of something that will help me right what is an optimal amount of resistance training that will help me what is the optimal amount of conditioning that will help me what is the optimal amount of you know of these types of stresses so that you're getting the benefit without getting into that you know overkill territory okay myth number five people eat too much fat um Historically speaking, people ate more fat than they do today, and they ate more saturated fat. So I'm not really buying that one either. Uh, people's consumption of dairy has gone down over the past 50 years. Their consumption of um, red meat has gone down. Um, they're still eating a lot of fat, but now it's more coming from seed oils and, and unsaturated fats. But they're not eating more fat than they did, let's say, uh, 70 years ago when everything was, you know, biscuits and gravy. There was a lot of fat consumed then and people were not heavy. 
perfect example of that is the French. Okay, the French, if you went to France in the 1970s, and this is something that is mentioned by a reference, uh, one of the many references I'll allude to throughout um, posting content, Brad Marshall, he he has a diet called the croissant diet. And he, he kind of did it as a uh, tongue-in-cheek kind of reference, but he's like, okay, carbs don't make you fat and fat doesn't make you fat because uh, the French in the 60s and 70s lived on butter and beef and starch and they were all thin right so so yeah and you have other countries um the scandinavian countries are ranked some of the healthiest countries in the world and guess what they um you know they just they don't have a problem uh you know they're healthy even though they eat a lot of saturated fat um so I don't believe it's so much eating too much fat. I think that not all fat is created equal. And that's something we'll dive into about how uh, people ate a lot back in the day. They eat a lot now, but what they're eating is different. It's very different. Myth number six, uh, people eat too much sugar or carbs. And um, again, I'll go back to that example. Um, in Asia, uh, they've always eaten a lot of carbs. In Europe, they've always eaten a lot of carbs. Um, the, you know, potatoes in Ireland and uh, grains and stuff. Uh, it it never made people fat before. So, if your conclusion is people are just eating more starch, it's like, well, that's what people mostly lived on: sugars and starches, right? Um, and the real the reality is, if if you're gaining weight from carbs. That's a symptom of a deeper issue. There's something metabolically, metabolically going on where you are not processing carbs correctly. It's having a different hormonal effect on you. It's causing you to gain fat. Um, there's something metabolically going on. It's it, Just because you've recognized a symptom does not mean that that's what the underlying cause is. So... Now that we've kind of gone through those myths, I, I'm hoping that I've kind of set a mind frame where, you know, it maybe it's not so black and white, so cut and dry. Maybe we need to have a little bit more of a nuanced understanding about um, how we need to look at nutrition and metabolic health and uh, dietary habits and things like that. Um, but I kind of summarized my view of this into four steps. Four, or or it's not even steps because they really can occur in any order. They should all be occurring um, at the same time. But I just—it's basically just four parts that that I'm broken this up to. So the first is reversing metabolic damage and eliminating problematic foods. So. Um, and and right there, I am implying that not all foods are created equal, not all calories are created equal. Um, and it goes back to that fire pit analogy. There are some foods and some food sources that will be very supportive to your metabolism and will allow you to immediately um, start seeing benefits. And then there are other food sources and, and types of foods that are going to impede in your ability to optimize your metabolism, right? And so we need to have an, a discernment process in place where we can recognize which of those foods is going to be beneficial to us versus uh, is going to sabotage us, okay? And in the process of figuring out what to eat more of and what to eat less of or what to eliminate altogether, that usually is when we start to reverse metabolic damage because the body, in my opinion, is capable of healing itself, provided you stop damaging it in the same way day after day after day. Okay, and then once we kind of figure out um, kind of the foods that are giving us problems or are sabotaging us, we also want to weigh more into the foods that are going to benefit us, right? So if I can eat something that is not just empty calories, but has higher nutrient density, 
right? It's a high bioavailability, the type of protein that it has. Uh, the fats are, uh, are going to be the type of fat that my body knows how to use. Uh, the carbs that I'm eating are going to be, you know, uh, um, most likely a natural source of carbohydrates. And for example, in fruit, where it's also accompanied by other compounds and micronutrients that will help me metabolize those sugars, right? So we want to weigh more into the foods that are going to benefit us and going to nourish us while, at, and, and that in and of itself will satiate us and make us less tempted to eat the stuff that is that is hindering us, okay? Um, and then we're also going to get into practicing self-care because it, it all ties together. A big part of optimizing your ability to lose weight and be healthy um, is managing cortisol levels and and um, you know and that is uh, very much related to things like stress and sleep quality. So we need to practice self-care because if you're feeding yourself great, but then you are abusing yourself in every other way. Um, can we really expect very good results? Probably not. Okay, and then I would say when you get those first three, um, you know, the, those items sorted out a bit more, then uh, it you'll start getting more of a return on your investment by developing your level of fitness by going to the gym. Uh, stimulate, you know, you're stressing the muscles, but then you, it's a stimulus so that they grow and you build more um, lean body mass so that your metabolism is better, right? Um, but I do have that as the last step because if you're going to the gym and you don't have those first three items um, in line, then you're probably just going to sabotage yourself more than you help yourself. All right, so let's talk about linoleic acid. And um, I feel bad for my friends and my family and my wife because usually the moment they ask me about my diet or, you know, how I lost weight or whatever, I really do go off on a tangent with this. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why is because this was such a major game. Once I understood how this worked, this made all the difference in the world for me between somebody who could never keep the weight off and always went through this yo-yo dieting and always had that 30 or 40 more pounds I wanted to lose to so now I'm at a point where, um, you know, the weight is stable, right? And, and I feel good even at this lighter weight. And, um, and so I did not understand this because to this day, uh, it's still, it's still, it, there's a growing awareness of it. Most people, particularly in the healthcare, um, I mean, uh, healthcare uh, industry and places like that, they really still don't make this discernment that not all fats are created equal. And so we're going to dive into it. And um, again, I'm not going to be whipping out the studies and you know going over the data. Um, I've looked at the data and I've listened to um, doctors and and other academics who've been able to put it in layman's terms. And this is just where my discernment process has taken me. So if you want to go deeper into this, I'll be happy to provide more thorough resources on why I'm phrasing things in, in this manner. But um, so linoleic acid is very abundant in what we consider to be the standard American diet. And what is the standard American diet? The standard American diet is a very grain heavy, oil heavy, um, protein limited, empty calorie, lacking in micronutrient way of eating. Okay. And so, you know, the, the most, the, the most, typical example that one thinks of with a Western American diet is like fast food, right? You go, you get your fried chicken sandwich with your side of French fries and your milkshake, right? What are we looking at? It's very high in calories. Okay. It has some protein in it for sure. But then, you know, you, that chicken is breaded in flour and is fried in canola oil. The French fries are this empty calorie starch that is then fried in 
the canola oil. And then you get this huge calorie load, a lot of carbs, a lot of fat, very little micronutrients. And, um, you know, and the, yes, it, it's an okay amount of protein, but as a ratio compared to those, those other calories, it's very, it's very lacking. Right. And so that's the standard American diet. We love our pizza. We love our bagels. We love our Chinese food. We love our frozen pizzas and our, our hot pockets and, um, you know, our potato chips and our Doritos and things like that. That's the standard American diet. And the standard American diet today is not the same as the standard American diet 100 years ago. It's not even the same as 50 years ago, because what has occurred over the past 100 years, as we have gotten fatter and fatter and unhealthier and unhealthier, is our we have swapped out a lot of our saturated fat in our diet with seed oils, with polyunsaturated fats, right? More of it's coming from the soybeans and the canola oil and the corn oil um, than used to be what used to be a lot of butter and cream and egg, right? And so even today you're going to these restaurants and you think you're getting butter and it's actually some sort of like butter blend or it's artificial butter, it's margarine of some sort, right? So the standard American diet, even though we keep hearing that we're supposed to get healthier and healthier and healthier, the less red meat, less saturated fat that we eat, we're actually seeing a complete opposite phenomenon happening. And that is that um, we're getting fatter and we're getting unhealthier and, um, and, and it correlates to the way we're currently eating. So linoleic acid, um, we used to, the amounts that we're eating today is probably about 10 times higher than what we ever would have eaten as either any sort of hunter gathering lifestyle or even like an early agricultural lifestyle, right? You didn't have um, year round access to seed oils. First of all, if you got seed oils, they were in the form of seeds. They weren't processed and chemically extracted. And uh, it was, you know, you ate the actual walnut or you ate the actual sunflower seed and that's how you got it. So first of all, your levels were way lower, were way lower simply because of the forms that it came in. And second of all, because generally seeds were a seasonal thing. You would only get them, you know, right before the winter. OK, so you just didn't have a lot, a very high level of this up until we got more into the, you know, the industrial farming age where we were growing seeds more on a on a, on a much higher scale. And, and these operations are figuring out how to how to sell not just, you know, whatever the main product was, but how do we make use of this other byproduct? Right. And so seed oils became more and more of a thing um, all the way, I believe, as early as 1890, um, farmers tried to figure out how to use their cottonseed oil. And then there was a, a point where that's where Crisco came out and then people didn't like that. But slowly, um, seed oils have become more and more prevalent in all of our food sources. They're in everything. They're in they're in all of those foods that I mentioned when describing the American diet. They're even in things that we don't think of as being high fat, right? Like uh, I was looking at my children's, uh, when, I, when I first started thinking this way, I was looking at my daughter's um, children's snacks, right? Her goldfish and her Cheez-Its and her um, club crackers and things like that. And you know, I'm thinking that this is some sort of dry, starchy type substance. And then I'm like, wait a second, there's like eight or 10 grams of fat per serving here. And it's all soybean oil or it's all canola, canola oil, right? So it's even things that we don't think of are have oil in it, have oil in it. Our coffee creamers, our salad dressings, uh, mayonnaise, um, a lot of sauces, uh, um, They it's used... It keeps frozen foods from drying out, which is why you'll see it as a primary ingredient, things like frozen pizzas and 
frozen chicken fingers and things like that. So, I mean, it's for, but what it comes from is seed oils, right? And, and that comes from the seeds, the nuts, the grains, um, and the legumes, the beans, and things like that. That's that's where all of this comes from. And then it's also made, even when we think we're not eating it, we're eating it because now a lot of the pork and the chicken and the salmon that we eat is also very high in this. And the reason why is because they are fed commercial feed, which is largely made up of these oils and these, you know, uh, soybeans and, and things like that, soybean and corn. And and they put extra oil in these feeds to fatten up their livestock, right? So, you know, when you're eating that fatty piece of bacon, it's kind of like sticking a straw into a bottle of canola oil, or you're eating the fatty chicken thigh or the fatty chicken leg um, or you're eating the farm-raised salmon, and um, farm-raised salmon is not the same as wild-caught salmon. It's not. They're fed a commercial feed that's high in omega-6 linoleic acid, and you can see the difference if you compare a piece of farm-raised salmon to uh, wild-caught salmon. Wild-caught salmon is a very dark red with very thin white striations, which is the fat within the meat. And if you look at a piece of farm-raised salmon, it is much those much more pronounced those those white striations. It's very it's a fattier cut of fish. And it is um people when people think that they're getting the benefits from eating salmon, it's like, oh, salmon's high in omega-3. It has a good omega-3 ratio. No, it doesn't. Not if it's farm raised. If it's farm raised, it is way more omega six fatty acid, and it's not providing any of the benefits. Um, and in fact, the reason that one of the reasons that they believe omega three uh, fats are beneficial is because they interfere with the oxidative effects of omega six fatty acids, which are uh, very prevalent in farm raised salmon. Um, and then, like I said, you know they're they're in everything they're in our snacks our prepared foods our processed foods our frozen foods you know people say like oh processed foods are bad it's like okay why you know not when you're chewing on food you're processing it right you're you're changing its form before it goes into your stomach so it's not the fact that it's processed that it's bad for you it's how are they processing it what are they what are the additives to the processing that are making these foods unhealthy. And you what you will see consistently across the board is soybean oil, soybean oil, soybean oil, canola oil, canola oil, canola oil. And you think that you're just biting into a chicken tender, which should ideally be nothing more than a piece of chicken and some breading. And then you, you've just ingested like 20 grams of soybean oil without even knowing it, right? So it is so infiltrated into our food sources and it in my opinion in my belief based on the research that i have uh, read and heard explain is that it is having a devastating effect on societies that are uh drastically increasing the consumption of th these seed oils mainly because of the content it's lin linoleic acid content which is the the, an omega-6 fatty acid okay and so i call this a trojan horse of fatty acids because um in my opinion a lot of the advice that we have doubled down on um you know about how these are held heart, heart healthy oils and you know they're good for you and they lower your bad cholesterol which is in my opinion all based on very faulty interpretation of data um you know we're still weighing into this in spite of the fact that we're seeing people get fatter and fatter we're seeing metabolic illnesses occur in younger and younger generations of people and um you know you would think that with all the transitions that we have made that we would have seen a measurable improvement in people's health and we're not. We're seeing things go in the opposite direction. So um, some of the mechanisms about why I believe that this substance does the body a lot of harm, um, 
is because it, well, one, it's highly unstable and and oxidative. All right. And we think about oxidative damage, right? What are things, what are other things that cause oxidative damage? Well, the biggest one I could think of is cigarettes. When you smoke a cigarette, it is causing oxidative damage to the tissue in your lungs and then throughout your body, um, which uh, can, you know, that's why it's correlated with the occurrence of lung cancer and things like that. So it causes all sorts of oxidative damage on a cellular level. And these fats are so unstable that plants figured out that they shouldn't even use them as you go into warmer and warmer cli uh, climates, which is why things like coconut, coconut has almost no linoleic acid. Um, cocoa beans and cocoa butter has almost no linoleic acid. Um, avocados have less linoleic acid. Uh, olives have less linoleic acid. Palm oil has relatively low linoleic acid. Why? Because if a plant, it's this stuff is so unstable that if the plant has linoleic acid in it and it destabilizes, it actually damages the plant too. So, you know, that's probably not a good sign that um, it's it's more unstable than other types of fat. It has a lower smoking point than other types of fat. OK, um, it's been shown to cause mitochondrial dysfunction. Your mitochondria are these little um, they're they're like a part of every uh, of almost every cell in your body. And they're responsible for aerobic um, your aerobic metabolism. Right. So they take oxygen and they take either glucose or fatty acid and they use that to make energy for the body. OK. It that it is a fundamental uh, biological process that is shared across different animal species. Okay, and the mitochondria they work the same. It's not like a mouse mitochondria works different than an elephant mitochondria than a dolphin mitochondria. For the most part, they all do pretty much the exact same thing. Okay, and so when you what we see is that when the mitochondria is forced to burn linoleic acid, it actually changes the shape of the mitochondria. It impedes its ability to metabolize glucose, um, which goes into why people start to gain weight on carbohydrates after a certain amount of seed oil exposure. Okay. And, and the bottom line is that that's not good. If that's your fundamental process for making sure that you stay alive. But think about it, right? You need oxygen. If you, it only takes what, two or three minutes before you're dead because you're out of oxygen. Well, what do you use the oxygen for? Well, you use it because the mitochondria use that to make the energy to keep your biological processes going, right? So if you are chemically suffocating yourself, you're probably not going to be healthy for a long period of time. All right. And then it also shows adipocyte dysfunction. So adipocytes are fat cells. And what happens is when fat cells um, are exposed to linoleic acid and these fatty acids, they become incapable of division and so they can they can't divide they can only grow which means they keep bloating until they explode and then when they explode then you have these surplus fatty acids that are circulating throughout your bloodstream and people think that oh well it's a heart healthy it's a it's a heart healthy oil because it lowers your cholesterol it lowers your cholesterol because the cell is bloating itself so it's a temporary false positive signal that later leads to very observable um metabolic dysfunction okay so so um and and this is not controversial this is observed under a microscope okay so adipocytes stop functioning properly and then when they they first they they grow you're triggering them to get larger which means you're getting fatter okay and then when they explode you're releasing all sorts of inflammatory markers and um, and then excess fatty acids that are now flowing through the bloodstream. 
Okay, and then, uh, which leads to the next thing that nobody seems to talk about, which is that in order for you to have arterial plaque, in order for you to have a blockage, that plaque is not just composed of cholesterol, it is composed of oxidized omega-6 fatty acids, right? So it's like, why, why is that not a factor when we're examining how to avoid um, arterial plaque buildup? When we know that in order for you to have oxidized LDL, um, you you have to have that in order for it to become arterial plaque. So so, you know, again, when we're talking about the correlation between eating more seed oils and seeing more be metabolic illnesses, this is another mechanism by which that occurs. And then, um, you know, we can see a very clear correlation you know, that um, in our own history in, in the United States, we've gotten fatter and fatter and fatter. There's more diabetes. There's more heart attack. There's more stroke. There's more hypertension. Okay. Uh, there's more other types of inflammatory diseases than there have been. And we have seen that regardless of the quote unquote conventional wisdom of eating less red meat, eating less saturated fats, eating more grains, uh, the opposite has been occurring. We also see this because um, there are countries that have more recently made the transition, and you can immediately see, uh, for example, um, in a lot of Asian countries that used to be historically an overall low-fat diet, right? So you don't have to eat high saturated fat. The whole point is to not eat a lot of linoleic acid, but you're seeing that in Asian countries there are increases on diabetes. There are increases on obesity. They're starting and have been getting a lot of the same issues that we have had. Um, and it's not a saturated fat thing because, you know, Samoans ate a lot of coconut. Um, there was a lot of pork and coconut in Southeast Asia, like the Philippines, right? There wasn't any obesity until the Western industrial foods started coming in that were largely compri comprised of seed oils. Um, okay, it's also shown to slow metabolic rate. So this is the other thing is that polyunsaturated fats in general tend to be in mammals an evolutionary signal that winter's coming and that it's probably better to one, store fat and two, slow your metabolic rate. This is why squirrels eat acorns. This is why black bears eat acorns and and um, grizzly bears eat fish, salmon, which is omega-3, but it's still a polyunsaturated fat. So you're telling your body, hey, winter's coming. There may not be a food, a lot of food around. Maybe we should put on a little a few extra pounds and uh, slow our metabolism down. Okay. And the other thing it does is it makes us hungry. Okay. Uh one of the mechanisms in our body that linoleic acid interacts with is called the endocabinoid system. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but basically, if that sounds sim similar to cannabis, that's because cannabis, the THC molecule, is a polyunsaturated fat. In fact, it's a lino I believe it's, it's a form of a linoleic acid. Okay. And so linoleic acid in general. Uh, stimulates this system, which gives you the munchies. And how many times have you heard, it's like, well, you know, every time I eat Chinese food, it doesn't matter how much I eat, I'm hungry an hour later. Well, pretty much all Asian cuisine at this point is very heavily um, uh, infused with high levels of soybean oil, right? So so um, there's this positive feedback loop where the more you eat the more you want to eat so you're you're not it's not just about what it does to you metabolically even if all you believed is that you know if you eat less you're going to lose weight well then why would you eat something that stimulates your appetite and and compromises your ability to be satisfied right so so even from that standpoint if you didn't believe anything else i said but you recognize that polyunsaturated fats tend to stimulate the appetite they're probably not that useful if you're trying to lose weight. Okay, so why did I go off on that tangent about linoleic acid? Well, we're talking about reversing metabolic damage. 
we're talking about eliminating problematic foods. Okay, so we're, we may want to consider decreasing seed oils. And I can tell you that this has benefited me immensely. This is by far the biggest game changer in how I've managed to lose a ton of weight and keep it off without starving, without being miserable and and constantly dep feeling deprived of, you know, I, I want a bag of potato chips. I could really go for some General Tso's chicken. I don't feel that anymore. I used to feel that. Um, be, and the, the reason why is that now I'm having enough other types of fat where I feel satisfied longer. And then without having the type of fat that's that's stimulating my cravings, right? So from a satiety standpoint, it this has helped me. But then also, you know, if my if if I am healing from mitochondrial damage, if my fat cells are starting to work properly and are no longer being signaled to grow and bloat, right? Then then overall my metabolism is most and my, and my health is most likely going to improve. This is my my belief, my thought process. You know, I'm not saying that. Yeah, I'm not making this as a recommendation to you. I'm just saying. This is where my discernment process has led me. All right. Um, but, you know, I, I really weighed heavily into that, but it's not the only thing that's bad for us, right? Like we probably don't want to drink too much because alcohol also causes oxidative damage and it stresses our liver, um, it stresses our kidneys. Uh, I think it's bad for our brain health to overconsume it, right? So we probably want to, consider decreasing our alcohol consumption. We probably want to eliminate smoking, right? I think we can all agree that even if smoking makes some people skinnier, it probably does more damage than more good. And that's something we want to get rid of. Um, <clears throat> we want to also want to pay attention to how other foods that we eat affect our body. Um, I have a, uh, <clears throat> a sister-in-law and she said, she saw that what I was doing and she decided to give her a shot for uh, herself. And she said, you know what? Um, whenever I used to eat food, I used to get like this, this hack, this phlegm buildup in the back of my throat. Like, and, and I thought, you know, maybe it was like the, the, the sugar or the, or the pesticides or whatever it is. And she's like, the moment I cut out those seed oils, um, I didn't have that anymore, right? And and so, and, and I'm not saying seed oils is the only thing that'll do that. Uh, I eat shrimp, and I and I get kind of almost like a minor um, allergy response in the back of my. I get kind of like an itchy, fiery throat a little bit, right? So I've kind of said to myself, well, maybe I should lay off the shrimp, right? You know, do, do I do I break out after eating something? Do I have uh? much harder time sleeping after eating something um does it change my mood after eating something does it change my energy level after eating something do my joints hurt do i have psoriasis do i have right is there any sort of like patterns that you could recognize i eat this and this happens i eat this and this happens and if that's the case you might want to try eliminating that and even as i go further into this and share some of the foods that i have found beneficial they may not be beneficial for you if you're having these responses to it, right? So so what I'm saying is pay attention to your body because if something is triggering an immune response, then chances are it's also triggering a cortisol response. And chances are that is going to be very counterproductive to your ability to lose weight. All right. And then a consider attending to your sleep habits. Like maybe, maybe you like to look at your cell phone up until the very last minute that you like to go to bed and maybe that causes you to go to bed at 1230 instead of 1130, you know, or, or maybe you need to like, you know, give yourself a ritual to help you unwind before you go to sleep so that you, uh, you know, that extra half hour, hour of sleep may be a huge resource for you. If you can start building it in by being more attentive, more pro uh, uh, proactive to your sleep habits right um and then also it shows that like uh 
significantly compromise sleep, like in the case of people with sleep apnea, that there's a very strong correlation between that and all-cause mortality. So, it, and guess guess what? Sleep ap apnea deoxygenates you, right? You're having a hard time maintaining a consistent flow of oxygen into your body. That's also going to affect your mitochondria, right? That's also going to affect your fundamental energy production system. So, you know, we might want to see, okay, are we sleeping long enough? What's the quality of the sleep? Maybe I should get a, a, a sleep test, especially if my snoring is keeping up my significant other and then they're miserable too because they can't sleep either, right? So so sleep is important. And if you address it, it can, in my opinion, also start reversing uh, metabolic stress or metabolic damage that's currently happening, okay? And then <clears throat> um, you may want to consider all out elimination diets. Maybe you have, maybe you suspect that, you know, something is giving you a problem and maybe it's a more subtle problem. Maybe, maybe your joints don't hurt a half hour after eating it. Maybe you have a problem three days later after eating it. Right. And so a lot of times what they'll do, is, especially with people with certain autoimmune diseases is they'll put them on certain types of elimination diets where they go down to, to a bare minimum uh, select group of foods generally things that are low inflammatory. And then they will slowly reintroduce one food at a time because after that elimination period, their body's probably much more sensitive to it and they'll get a much stronger feedback as to, you know, is this is this something my body is tolerating well or not? Um, because if you want to lose weight, then you also have to address cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And the stress hormone is going to be fired up if you're giving your body things that agitate it, right? So um, we're going to go off on another tangent here. We just talked about linoleic acid, and this is going to relate to why I love anything that comes from a cow. Um, so I, I kind of talked earlier about how I feel that saturated fat has gotten a bad rap. I think a lot of the things that have been blamed on saturated fat um, are actually the result of other variables which were not accounted for in very sloppy epidemiological studies. Um, the original hypothesis where they thought increased saturated fat was the primary cause of heart attack, heart disease, things like that, uh, was, I think that, I think it originated, I'd like to say in the 1950s, uh, by a gentleman named Ansel Keys, who decided to make his observations in already westernized industrial societies that were already consuming large amounts of of seed oils and so he didn't account for that other variable it did not occur to him that like hey maybe i should go to places where they're only eating saturated fat but not the other stuff that these industrial societies are right like he didn't go to samoa um where they were only eating coconut and pork uh, he did not go to certain tribes in Africa and certain tribes in the Amazon where you could have gotten a clearer test group to say, okay, this is high saturated fat and only high saturated fat versus, let's say, people who are eating lower saturated fat. And so what happened is a lot of the – what what in my opinion, what he found was that if you already are metabolically unhealthy – as a result of eating too much seed oils, then yes, that cholesterol can wind up as a component in the arterial plaque. But he didn't account for the variables. And we know that this is not so much the case because people are eating less red meat, people are eating less dairy, people are eating less saturated fat. People are eating more seed oils and they're still getting sicker. And we also see that in a lot of these indigenous tribes, 
where they're only eating saturated fat or monounsaturated fat, then they're not having the same problems as the people in all of these high seed oil consumption consumption societies, right? So I personally do not buy the narrative that saturated fat is a cause of metabolic illness. I, I do not believe that at all. I think that it is a variable for somebody who is already meta metabolic metabolically ill. Okay. So the reason I like ruminants and a ruminant is things like cows, goats, sheep, lamb, bison, um, elk, things like that is because these stomach, these animals have four stomachs within their stomachs. They have bacteria that transform that very unstable polyunsaturated fat into saturated fat. And so when that is why when you get a bottle of milk, it's very high in saturated fat. Or when you get a ribeye steak, it's very high in saturated fat. It is because these animals convert the polyunsaturated fats, and they're able to do it in a way that single-stomached animals like pigs and chickens and salmon are not able to do it. So um, when you, um, so you have this animal. The first, first, they're good at mitigating the linoleic acid. They're also good at just extracting a lot of nutrition from their, uh, you know, from their feed. And it translated into a very nutrient dense meat. So meat has a lot of different micronutrients and compounds in it that you, um, many of which are in a much less bioavailable form uh, if you do find them in plant-based foods. And some of them are not available at all. Um, there's a higher a, a riboflavin in the liver is much more bioavailable. Um, iron is more avail bioavailable in beef than it is in plant-based foods um then you have things like creatine which i don't think you can even find in a plant-based food uh, anyway not to go off on a tangent but it there's a it's very nutrient dense so anything that comes from a cow one uh, protects me from that overconsumption of lin linoleic acid and two it's satisfying my ability to uh, eat a nutrient dense food, which ideally will nourish me and satiate me. And so beef and dairy, like I said, they're lower in linoleic acid. Um, and they're the cornerstone of my diet. I am always cooking, uh, beef and steak and ground meat. And, um, I use, I, I drink milk. I cook with milk and butter and cheese uh, because I know that I can tap into those food sources. I can get a lot of protein. I can get a lot of micronutrients. Um, I can get a form of fat that my body, evolutionarily speaking, is much more used to processing. So these are all benefits for me. Okay. And so this is why we go back to, well, we want to optimize our nutrient density, right? So animal protein has a much higher leucine content and leucine is the primary amino acid that tells our body to build muscle right so if we want to cultivate lean body mass if we want to make sure that you know we have a thriving metabolism and that we stay strong and healthy we probably want um, enough leucine in order to do that in order for me to get an equivalent amount of leucine out of a plant-based protein i have to eat more of it which again defeats the purpose of satiety. I don't want to have to eat more. I want to get all my essential nutrients in as little calories as possible because that is going to satiate me while eating less calories, right? So so the protein is more bioavailable and tends to be in a better ratio of amino acids that is uh, for our utilization, okay? Um. Red meat has a lot of micronutrients, like I talked about. Organ meats have a lot of micronutrients. Um, iron, riboflavin, 
Um, I think there's some copper in there. There's different, vi there's fat soluble vitamins that um, you will not find in plant-based foods. And if you do find them in plant-based foods, right, what type of fat are you being forced to eat in order to get those fat-based vitamins, the, those fat soluble vitamins, right? Collagen, um, are the amino acids in collagen are shown to be very complementary to the amino acids in beef, um, probably because we evolved to eat multiple parts of the animal and not just the, the muscle meat. So these are all nutrient dense, very useful uh, food sources. Okay, and dairy also has a lot of protein. It has whey protein, it has casein protein. Now, not everybody does good on dairy. And like I said, if you don't do good on dairy, then don't eat dairy. But there's a lot of people who do well on dairy and there is a lot of nutrients in dairy. It has a lot of calcium. It has, you know, it, it's hard to find a lot of vitamin D and dairy, particularly milk, has a fair amount of vitamin D in it, um, which is also extremely important for metabolic health. Uh, okay, so remember when I said um, chickens and and pigs and salmon, you know, they eat this uh, this commercial feed that's very rich in soybean oil or corn oil, et cetera. And so that's why I don't eat commercial eggs. I'll eat the egg whites because there's no fat in them, but I don't eat the commercial egg yolks. Um, if you're going to eat whole eggs, you may want to consider uh, picking up pastured eggs because a larger percentage of their diet is going to be the bugs and and little things that they find um, and they're going to have a better fatty acid profile in their yolks than uh, a commercially raised chicken. Um, I'll also eat, you know, because I'm concerned about the fat type of fat that's on chicken or pork, I will eat the leaner cuts, right? So I don't eat chicken skin. I don't eat dark meat chicken, but I will have a chicken breast, a skinless chicken breast. I will have a lean pork loin or um, low fat ham. Uh, I'll have that because even though they're fed to this stuff, the absolute levels of fat are low enough where I'm still mitigating my intake of linoleic acid. Um, and I'll, I'll eat wild caught salmon because that's much higher in omega-3, much lower in omega-6. Same thing goes for cod. Um, sardines are great. Sardines also do not have a lot of heavy metals in them. They're a, the smaller fish. They don't accumulate the same levels of mercury. So I like sardines, but don't buy sardines if they're canned in soybean oil or any other type of oil. You're going to want to find the sardines that are, maybe they're in tomato sauce or, or something like that. Um, same thing goes for shellfish, right? Uh, shellfish have a lot of copper, which uh, is important in... in uh, it's important, I believe, to maintain a balance between copper and iron. So shellfish, things like oysters, um, uh, clams, uh, that will, I don't eat a ton of it, but I'll have, I'll work that into my diet periodically. Um, fruit and honey. So I know I've been raving about animal-based foods, but um, you can also get a lot of nutrition from fruit and honey. Fruits tend to be... Uh, more favorable than vegetables because that is the part of the plant that it wants you to eat. There's going to be less defense chemicals. That's why fruit have are much lower in phytates and phytic acid than other parts of the plants like the shoots and the leaves and the, and the roots and the stems is because um, they're saying, hey, take this, eat the fruit, spread my seeds around, right? So um, and honey uh, tends to be, uh, you know, that it, it's a natural, uh, I would still call it an animal-based food. Um, it's comprised, I believe, mostly of fructose, and it has a lot of B vitamins in it. So I am not, I'm not a low-carb guy. Um, I'm a healthy-carb kind of guy. And I think that since we probably spent most of our history eating fruit, um, and fructose that we're probably going to do better with that. Now you'll hear some conflicting concerns that fructose is bad for the liver, et cetera. Um, I think that there's, uh, it's probably getting a bad rap the same way that saturated fat does. I think that it's a more nuanced conversation. And I think that since we have evolved 
to eat fruit, we're probably okay eating fruit. Um, and if you are going to do plant-based fats, you're going to want to have uh, use the fats that have much lower linoleic acid. Coconut um, and cocoa butter are grown in tropical regions. They do not have a lot of linoleic acid in them because it's not helpful to the plant to have such an unstable fat in such a warm climate. Uh, same thing goes for avocado and olives. They're more tropical, but also avocados and olives are fruits. When you eat the avocado, you're not eating the nut, you're eating the fruit, the that the part of the plant that it wants you to eat. The same thing goes for an olive. Um, I do not eat a lot of olive oil or avocado oil because um, um, they can still be adulterated. Uh, a lot of times these... Uh, Food producers are are sabotaging the quality, and, and they're mixing in other things like soybean oil. So, so I don't, I just don't trust it. Um, I'll eat an avocado, I'll eat an actual olive, um, but I still try to mitigate those oils, even though they probably are much better than using canola or corn, um, or or soybean oil. Okay, and then vegetables. The reason I say maybe is because. I don't think there's anything that great about vegetables. And there's a lot of discussion about whether vegetables are kind of just, they don't, they don't have much benefits or their, their drawbacks outweigh their benefits. I don't think vegetables are bad. I eat vegetables. Um, I find them psychologically satisfying as part of a meal. Um, you know, I eat, I will eat like zucchinis. I like onions. I, I put, uh, I use certain seasonings, right? So I don't have anything against vegetables, um, but I don't think that they are nearly as useful or beneficial as everything listed above them. Um, it's more just like, if you do fine on them, great. If you don't do fine on them, there's a lot of nutrition and all those other food items that I just mentioned. All right, and then... Um, we're going to go to step three, which is self-care. So self-care is more just about, you know, how are you managing your lifestyle, right? How are you sleeping? Are you sleeping enough? How's your quality of sleep? Do you, should you get a sleep test? Um, how is your, or how are your stress levels? It, I know everybody, and it, you know, it's e easier said than done. It, you know, I was talking about how I, didn't like the oversimplifications I got in trying to lose weight. And a lot of these do come across as oversimplifications and I'm not here to make suggestions. I'm just here to say, well, you know, these are other areas that you may want to, to attend to in whatever way works for you. Right. So if that means that you have to be more proactive with getting yourself unwound so that you go to sleep at a reasonable time, then that might be what you have to do. Managing stress. Jobs, jobs are important, money is important, but is it so important that it's killing you or that it's driving your cortisol through the roof and ruining, you know, and then you're bringing home that frustration to your family and then it's straining your relationships? Because um, in my opinion, if, you, if I have to choose between having more money or living longer and being healthier, I'm going to choose between living longer and being healthier. So just ask yourself, what am I doing to manage stress? Maybe I need to meditate for 10 minutes in the morning. Maybe I need just need to speak for somebody once a week or once every other week just to uh, just to get things off my chest and detangle all the thoughts that are racing in my head. So what are you doing to manage your stress? You know, how physically demanding is your job, right? If if you're working your butt off as a landscaper 6 days a week in 95 degree weather and you're burning 4000 calories a day, and you're struggling to stay hydrated, maybe it doesn't make sense for you to also go to the gym and try to be a power lifter, right? Like maybe you should just focus on doing all the other things well and then either letting that be an adequate amount of stress for you or rearranging your work schedule where it, it's not so physically demanding. But it has to be accounted for because if you're if you are under high physical demand, and you're not sleeping properly, and you're not eating properly, and you're not managing your stress properly, I guarantee you that your cortisol levels are high. And even if you're burning a lot of calories, that doesn't mean, A, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be 
thin. And two, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be healthy. And then how are your relationships and relationships and stress are, are, you know, intertwined because if your relationships are struggling, it's stressing you out. And if you're stressed out, you're probably not doing the best of your relationships. So, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, you're going to have to answer that question. Right. But if you can improve your relationships and if you can feel better about what you walk into the door when you come home, you know, or what unresolved issues need to get aired out so that you can have better feelings towards your, your parents and your siblings and your in-laws, then maybe that's what you need to focus on. Because when you're on good terms with your family and, and you can build something between them, it, it's a very valuable resource. And it, 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 again, that will help with the overall stress management. Um, and how are your finances? I know that I said, you know, don't kill yourself for money. But at the same time, a lot of times people struggle in finances because they need to evaluate those habits the same way they evaluate their nutritional habits, right? And if we put a certain plan of action in place where, you know, you're not hemorrhaging money and you're digging out of debt or or you're you're, you know, you have some sort of hope for the future, right? Then that also goes back to managing stress. That also goes back to making you feel better. That also goes back to giving you more time to be more proactive with the other areas of your life where you need to plan out and, and be more disciplined, right? So this is all part of self-care. Are you taking care of yourself? Because if a lot of times what people do is they put themselves, their health on the back burner and say, well, you know, I'll just work so darn hard. Who cares? I'll lose the weight letter later. I'll quit smoking later. I'll quit drinking later. I'll make it up to my family. When I'm rich, I can go to the, to the all-inclusive resort and recover from my ridiculous amount of stress that I've incurred over the past five years working this high-pressure job, right? And so if you're treating yourself like a martyr, it's usually has a pretty crappy return on investment. It normally backfires because when you treat yourself well, you give yourself more time, which means you give yourself more time to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. So, so don't treat yourself like a martyr. Your health is an investment and it's an asset. And so by building that up first, it translates back into your ability to perform elsewhere being a better parent, being a better spouse, being a better worker, better, making better decisions. Okay. So, so people who tend to, who try to tyrannize themselves and then saying that they'll make up for it later on may never get that opportunity to do so. Okay. Um, and then when you start getting all those other things tweaked and you know that your time in the gym will create a positive uh, a positive benefit, a stimulus that will actually make you healthier, then by all means, it's time to start working out. So resistance training is my preferred, it, it, it takes priority. And the reason it takes priority is because resistance training kills many more birds with one stone as opposed to let's say endurance training. Resistance training, burns calories, just like endurance training does. But it also does a better job of building lean body mass, which will raise your mess resting metabolism, okay? And will also help in your overall metabolic health, okay? Uh, it also uh, supports stronger bones and connective tissue. Um, and so muscles are essential for metabolic regulation. Okay, muscle people think that the only reason muscles exist are to make you strong and help you move stuff or help you move yourself, right? And muscles are much more important than that. They're like they're like glands. They are um the largest disposal site for cholesterol. They're the largest disposal site for glucose. They help in regulating inflammatory responses. Right? So muscles are extremely important and your ability to build and maintain lean body mass throughout your lifetime is going to make a huge difference in the quality of your aging. Okay, and 
So muscles will raise your resting metabolism because the more lean body mass that you have, the more calories they require to sustain themselves. So there's, there's, you know, again, this goes back to the why calories in calories out is such an, uh, an oversimplification. If you're eating in a way that builds muscle, then you're raising your calorie burning potential. All right. And then if you have low muscle mass, it increases your chance of all cause, mort all cause mortality, right? If you have soft bones and you have little fast twitch muscle fibers and you can't quickly correct your balance because you're too weak and too uncoordinated and you fall and break a hip, you're in a lot of trouble, right? So low muscle mass, not only does it just, does it sabotage you metabolically, but it also, um, sabotages your ability to avoid injury and recover from injury. All right. It, uh, fitness also prolongs cognitive health, um, way more so than working on crossword puzzles or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, word searches. Okay. Uh, there's way more support that shows that people who maintain their physical health also get, um, they, they stave off cognitive decline as they age. All right. So this is my approach and uh, I hope you found it useful. I am going to be focusing on sharing content that goes deeper into a lot of the different topics that I touched upon here. And, um, and the reason I'm, I'm doing that is because I want to, I feel that, um, there's too much of the old garbage being recycled and regurgitated over and over and over again. And it is causing people to grind their gears. People are trying to do what they think is the right thing. And then a lot of it's actually sabotaging their ability to get results. All right. So um, I'm very passionate about this because I really feel that um, we could put a lot of years on a lot of people's lives. We could um, improve the quality of a lot of people's lives. We could really turn around the obesity epidemic that is currently plaguing, at this point, a lot of the world. If people just got more updated with a lot of these new realizations about nutrition, and so um, I hope you found this interesting. I'd really appreciate if you like and subscribe and if you share um, this with other people. And uh, I'm not saying you have to agree with everything. Um, I'm Again, this is where my discernment process has brought, brought me. A lot of the content I'm going to share is going to reinforce or, or it's going to elaborate on why I believe what I believe. And, um, and I, I really think that, uh, I really think that this might benefit some people. Okay. Um, so thanks for watching. And, um, again, please like subscribe, share, and, um, also comment. And if you have any questions or, you know, you want to share any of your own thoughts or whatever, um, I'm, I'm always open to that. Um, I don't like to, um, attack people who philosophically disagree with me I, I try not to be too ideological um so you know if you're like you want to bring up counterpoints um and maybe i don't have the answers for him so i was like okay well i think uh, what i'll probably be doing is just say i think this person um had a response for that point or this person had a response to that point and i'll reference people who are much more articulate than i am for because I know that nutrition is a very controversial subject and I, I, I want to make sure that we're maintaining mutual respect um, in these discussions. So, all right. Thanks for joining me guys and um, happy new year. And I really um, look forward to sharing more with you.